Okay, well, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Libby Bulger, and I work at NOFA Vermont, which is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. We're based in Richmond, well, at home right now, like most of you, um, but we are a statewide organization. And this is our 11th annual Agricultural Literacy Week, um, which is pretty awesome. And this is the first year that it's been done in a virtual format, but it also feels really exciting to think about so many folks who are able to join us virtually who wouldn't normally be able to if this was in person at a library. So while we're mourning normalcy, we're also embracing possibility and excited to have you all here with us tonight. Um, let me just switch a couple of things around so I can see you all. So like I said, this is the 11th annual event of ours and Ag Literacy Week is a project of NOFA Vermont, the Vermont Department of Libraries and the Vermont Agency of Ag Food and Markets. And this year our theme focuses on community resilience. And while there are a lot of ways to set up a Zoom meeting, uh, probably neater, more condensed ways to do so. I wanted to set it up in this way where we could all see each other because I feel like when we think about community resilience, we think about our neighbors and who folks that we see at the grocery store or on our dog walks every morning. And we think about the change that we wanna see in the world that we wanna create in, our, in the way that we move through the world, it's really with each other and in community. And so if folks could just pop on their cameras for a minute and you can scroll through and see who else is here, I think that that really just, I just like to call that out and center that um, because without you all, this would just be me and Jesse hanging out cooking. So really glad to have you all here. Thanks for making space to come out during a dark and hard challenging time. Um, and I would also just like to lift up the idea of this time together being a break from the reality of right now, which is really challenging and continues to be um, and just wanting to take care of ourselves this evening if folks need to step away or they need to turn their cameras off or go grab dinner for their families, like do yourself and be you tonight. Um, it's dinner time. So if you're having a plate of food, that's great. Definitely don't shy away from that. Um, and yeah, just wanting to make sure that we're humans while we engage together tonight. Um, so what is NOFA? Some folks might be wondering. Uh, NOFA is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, one of those really fun long acronyms. And we are a statewide organization, like I mentioned. We're also a membership organization made up of over 1,100 farmers, gardeners, homesteaders, and good food enthusiasts like yourself. Um, our membership helps us to stay relevant to what folks are needing on, on the ground from farmers to consumers, people who run farmers markets, folks who are shopping, you know, indulging the local food system and engaging with us. So we really pride ourselves in doing a lot of different varieties of things and that helps us engage with a lot of different folks. So we hope that uh, this isn't the last time that we have engagement with you and that you're able to kind of join on the NOFA bandwagon if you're not already on. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of new folks joining tonight who I haven't seen before. So that's really exciting. Thanks for coming out. I would also just like to talk a little bit about our mission. Uh, the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont promotes organic practices to build an ecologically viable, ecologically sound and socially just Vermont agricultural system that benefits all living things. So when we're thinking about uh, that trifecta is really key to success for us in the state and making sure that all those pieces are supported in our work. And a few of our programs include working with farmers, offering technical assistance, writing business plans, launching farms, helping with transition plans. It also involves education and engagement like what we're doing tonight, but also our annual winter conference, on-farm workshops that we host, cooking delicious pizza with our wood-fired pizza oven that travels around the state, um, and also engaging with our membership. We also work on pol policy and advocacy to make our voices heard at the state house, advocating for farmers and consumers and the environment. And we also believe that food access, all of this amazing local food that's grown in Vermont should be accessible for everybody. And so we work through those means through the community food access programs that we run and some of those look like 
subsidize CSAs for limited income Vermonters and seniors, especially uh, folks who are using their EBT or their food stamp card when they go to the farmer's market for double coupons and matching programs at farm stands. And so really just widening the table and letting people into what we're up to and knowing that this movement is better with everybody on board. So in thinking about that, Ag Literacy Week is very much that in a nutshell, right? It's about being agriculturally literate and what that means. And so I'm gonna share my screen and show a short video that um, one of our staff members, Greg Stevens, put together that introduces the ag literacy theme before we head into Jesse's workshop tonight. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. of the Department of Libraries and your state librarian. I'd like to welcome you to Agricultural Literacy Week. In understanding Agricultural Literacy Week, it's important to understand why agricultural literacy is important to everyone, particularly from a library perspective. We're all about learning and literacy, and understanding how food is grown helps everyone understand the importance of where food comes from, how we consume it, how we dispose of it, and how it nourishes us. So it also helps farmers, those in agriculture, and all persons who want to make a life in growing food. In understanding that food helps communities in a variety of ways, one is resilience. To have a resilient community, one must have systems in place that can weather adversity. Food is one of those systems that we must understand. So I want to thank you for participating in this year's Agricultural Literacy Week, and I look forward to you joining our events. Thank you. Hi, my name is Grace O'Dell, and I'm the Executive Director of NOFA Vermont. We're so glad that you're joining us for Agricultural Literacy Week. Ag literacy is critical to our work at NOFA in building a just, verdant, and ecologically thriving food system. Everyone needs to understand how food is grown, how it gets from the field onto your plate, all the people along the way who support that process. Understanding the how of how our food system works is so critical to transforming the food system we have to the food system we need. A community that's truly resilient is a community that's in right relationship with its place and its land, with the people who make up that community, and with its values. These offerings we're excited to share with you as part of this Agricultural Literacy Week are a small way of helping share some of our values with you and inviting you to join us. Thank you so much for joining. We hope you enjoy. Great. Thanks for listening and helping with the audio, everybody. Um, so a couple, ironically, a couple Zoom 101 bits. Um, I'm going to keep everybody muted. If you have questions for Jesse during the presentation, you can put them into the chat box. And I will be um, reading those out to him as they come up. And then we'll hopefully hold like 10 or so minutes at the end for additional questions. So with that, I will pass it off to Jesse Lair. Thanks so much. My turn. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my home kitchen in Burlington, Vermont. Thank you for joining me. Um, I've got to say this is probably my largest audience to date. So bear with me if I'm a little nervous. Um, so a little bit about myself. I am the executive chef at Sweetwaters, Vermont. I've been the executive chef there for a little over three years. Uh, I've been cooking 10 years professionally and kind of where I've been the last couple of years of my culinary career is focusing on indigenous foods and more, spe more specifically Abenaki foods and what were our cultivars, you know, wild game, fish, also wild edibles. So that's kind of been my journey. Um, I'm no way an expert on Abenaki foods. All I do know is how to put foods together, make them taste good. So a lot of what I've been doing lately is research and development, kind of 
what certain flavor profile squash hold, corn, beans, etc., and how to put those together in a contemporary way. Um, and also, I'm a citizen of Missisquoi Abenaki in Swanton, Vermont. My Abenaki lineage comes from my father and my grandfather's side, going back and forth between Vermont and Canada. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't have an ingredient list earlier for those who wanted to cook with me, um, but I thought this would be easier. So what we're gonna do today is a three sister stew, the three sisters being corn, beans, and squash. Um, the corn came from All Souls Tortiera here in Burlington, Vermont. It is not an Abenaki variety, it's a Midwestern variety, but I do have Callis Flint corn that I got from Carrie Wood who is Abenaki, she grew it. We're gonna do a hot water cornbread with that. Um, I've got East Montpelier squash, which is an Abenaki variety and Jacob's cattle bean, which is a Wabanaki variety. So that was grown from here to Maine, New Brunswick. So yeah, we're gonna get started. Um, so what I did last night, take you with me. I made a veg stock. Um, this is made with carrots, Onion, celery, I threw potatoes and some Algonquin squash in there just to kind of give it some body and thicken it up so that the stew is nice and rich. Um, I pre-cooked the Jacob's cattle beans and I pre-cooked the hominy just so that we weren't here for five hours. But <laughs> give you a little bit of what I'm doing here. Um, this is what the East Montpelier squash looks like one half of it. The inside is beautiful, almost kind of like butternut. Um, it's a lot sweeter. This is probably my favorite variety that we have in our seed bank. Um, I'm also not a seed saver, so I can't really speak to where it comes from, what was bred from it, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of people who are more knowledgeable than me on that subject. So I'm just getting this ready to cut and roast. Um, I like to cut my squash or I like to roast my squash. If I'm going to put it into a super stew, it kind of gives it just like a little bit more resilience to hold up in there because I don't want it to completely disintegrate. And the roasting adds another layer of flavor within that stew. And feel free to ask any questions that you'd like. Probably help me with my dialogue. Jesse, this is Libby. I'm curious about how much food you're making. Is this enough for like a family of four or a larger group or to take to a party? I'd probably say a hungry family of four. You could probably stretch it out till six. Probably six people. It depends on what you, how much you eat. Um, yeah, I'd say four to six people for sure. Cool. And yes, Lena, that's the squash that he's cutting. Some folks are asking about where they could find a squash like this or uh, maybe that's similar in taste perhaps. Blue Hubbard, you can get Blue Hubbard. I want to say Blue Hubbard came from this, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, this being an Abenaki variety, this is a rather rare breed. Uh, we have this in our seed bank and it's not readily available to those outside of the tribe. But I would say Blue Hubbard or Butternut would be a good substitute. Cool. And when you talk about the seed bank, can you share more about what that is? Um, so each of the four bands in Vermont have people that grow and continue to save those seeds for next year. Um, I know Amy Rose Foyle is in the audience. She's, I think, out in Virginia. She's Abenaki as well. She does a lot with seed saving. Um, Fred Wiseman has built up our catalog with the help of a lot of other people. But yeah, it's basically 
just getting the seeds back to the tribe and holding them back in the tribe. And that's happening all across native country today too. So what I'm gonna do now is I don't have sunflower seed oil. I would be using that, but I'm gonna use avocado oil. Granulated maple sugar. I like to use this in cooking a lot versus maple syrup. Add some nice texture when it caramelizes. And I think it has a more concentrated flavor. A little cured sumac. So you just pick sumac berries off a tree, keep them whole, pack them in salt, and then rub them off. Then some kosher. And is the skin still on the squash or did you peel it off? No, I did peel that off. I've actually never peeled the uh, East Montpelier squash. I've always roasted it whole. It's probably my favorite way right in the charcoal. So that was new. I wasn't sure how thick the skin would be. And it actually, it came off with a peeler. Algonquin squash or Penobscot pumpkin. I needed to take mine off with a knife. So different squash has different thicknesses on the skin. It's got a little parchment lined sheet tray. I'm gonna lay out my squash evenly. And pop it into a 375 degree oven for about half hour and then we'll check it. Just wanted to point to the chat folks that a lot of folks are asking about how to get a hold of these seeds or how to grow these varieties in their gardens. <coughs> Amy Rose, who Jesse just mentioned, um, has seeds available and she included her email there in the chat. So when I email everybody after the workshop, I can include that if you didn't catch it since there's a lot going on in the chat. Couple questions about sumac, Jesse. Um, when you're collecting the sumac, do you add the salt once removing once removing the berries? Yeah, so it's staghorn sumac. I take the berries are kind of like this cone shape. They're all little. They have hard seeds in them. I'll snip off a bunch of them and then I'll layer in like a hotel pan, kosher mm -hmm. salt, and then pack those whole berries on that and then cover it again in salt and let it sit for about a week. And for those of you who don't know about sumac, it has like a very lemony flavor, it adds some nice brightness to a lot of dishes. It's also very popular in Middle Eastern cuisine as well. All right. Now Jesse, gonna... quick question about the preparation. Sorry, this is Jeanette, Department of Libraries. A quick question about the, the preparation of the squash. Uh, I assume you're peeling and cutting it in cubes so that it will be more firm rather than cut it in half and just roast it in the oven in halves unpeeled. Is that is that why you're doing it that way? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Because uh, it's going into the Three Sisters stew, I want the beans to hold their shape and be noticeable. I want the hominy to hold its shape, be noticeable and same thing with the squash. So roasting it and giving it that little extra layer of caramelization on the <clears throat> individual pieces instead of just roasting it until it's like a mashed consistency will help everything hold together. Great, thank you. Jesse, when is the time that you would be looking for sumac for harvesting? Is that now? I usually pick it late July, early August before heavy rains come in and uh, the flavor will deplete the later the heavy rains go. You could still pick it today and the flavor would be there. It just wouldn't be as vibrant as that late summer season. I'm going to jump in here, Jeanette, um, to help Livy a little bit with the chat. So there's a question on how you can tell the difference between poison and staghorn sumac. So from my understanding, and again, I'm not crazy knowledgeable about plants, 
But if they're if it's poison sumac, the berries will be white, and the staghorn sumac is pretty noticeable and very very easy to identify. So that'll be red. Mm-hmm. But if Thank someone you. else is more knowledgeable than me, please speak up. One more sumac question. This is a hot topic. Um, Someone's found that there's like little hairs on the sumac. Is there a special way that you get rid of those so that they're edible and easy to use in a recipe? So the hairs are what you actually want. The inside is a very hard seed and that's what you're gonna discard. Once uh, once I cure the sumac, I usually take a fine mess sieve and then just rub that like crazy and that'll the seeds will stay on top of the sieve and the hairs will fall down so the hairs are what you want that's where that lemony citrusy brightness comes from cool great question um someone else is asking about the recipe that you're making is this something that you learned from your dad or your grandpa or is this an original oh this is pretty standard across three sisters soups recipes this is my version of it unfortunately within my family we never had any of the foods or you know beyond wild game we didn't have any recipes with corned beans or squash my family always passed down art where food was never never that important not maybe not important but that knowledge wasn't there, I guess. But so a lot of what I do is from talking with other native chefs, whether they're home chefs or professional, doing my own research and my own experimentation, if you, or if you, yeah, if you have that and finding out what tastes good and yeah. All right, so the veg stock is strained. Got the hominy that's cooked. That'll go in. And again, this is a stew, not a soup. So it's gonna be very thick, very hearty. Also, I'm terrible at cooking dry beans. They always come out mushy. I think that's because I always hit too much heat on them. Does anybody in the audience have tips for dry beans? Love to hear about it. I would also love to hear that. I do. I someone did tell me to add a little bit of uh little bit of baking soda while cooking the beans and that gives them the insides of creaminess but I always try to simmer it real slow and I think I just overcook them but this isn't a bad batch actually I'm seeing some instapot the four or five folks either crock pots or instapots what about over fire I don't want to use instapots or crock pots <laughs> uh, pressure cooker about cast iron over a fire. What's the, what's the tips? <laughs> I don't see any there. <laughs> you can add a little bit of vinegar at the end of cooking to tighten the outside of the beans. While cooking? Or you said in the beginning? At the end of cooking. At the end of cooking. Where the baking soda softens the beans. Okay. So here I'm gonna do a little non-traditional ingredient. Uh, This is a first for me, but I've been talking to a fellow chef friend um, who's Mohawk. His name is Dave Michalski, and I probably butchered his last name, but he recently did a Three Sisters recipe, and he added white miso. So I am going to use Rhapsody Red Miso. And he just is said there, that. Is there any reasoning behind that? I asked him and he said it just adds this layer of complexity in the flavor that people just go crazy for. And it kind of brings through some of these umami flavors that you don't get all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try it out. Nice. 
There's a lot of good bean energy going on in the chat that I'll <laughs> share with you after this, Jesse. Um, someone is asking about where they can find Hominy. Did you say All Souls? Yeah, All Souls right in Burlington. They uh, they do a really good job. You can also grow the beans and nixtamalize it yourself as well if you're risky. Okay. So to go with our stew, whenever I cook any kind of stew, I always want some kind of bread. So we're gonna do a hot water cornbread. So what we're gonna do is boil some water, move the camera. This is some cornmeal that I fresh ground this morning from Callus Flint corn. Which smells amazing. And not and this will make probably enough for six, seven, eight nice size pieces of cornbread. It's about a cup. Add some salt. maple sugar again. You can omit the maple sugar if you don't want a sweet cornbread. Did you grind the flour at home? Um, I actually did it at work in a Vitamix. Nice. Sifted it in small batches and sifted it cool. into the flour. Right. And folks are asking for recipes, so for recipes? Uh, yeah. Are you winging it? I always wing it. I yep. am a terrible chef in that regards. I don't write down recipes, but it was about a cup of dry beans, uh, Jacob's cattle beans. You can get those at any Hannaford's around here. Um, about a cup of hominy. Uh, that was one half. That was probably like two cups of squash. And the veg stock, you can either make that or buy that, whichever you'd like. I always tend to try to make it if I can, if I have everything on hand, but box stuff works. And so for the, the cornbread, it's about a, about a cup. Um, just liberally season it with the salt and the maple sugar. and mix everything and taste it. More maple, more salt. Is there a reason why you would use um, maple sugar instead of maple syrup for this? Um, in this, because I am adding the hot water, so I don't want another liquid in there. Um, and I just, I love maple sugar. It's probably my favorite way to consume maple. So then we'll just wait for that water to boil. It shouldn't be long now. And I just add the water until it starts to come together. I don't add it all at once because if you add it all at once, you can't take it away. You can always add more. So with any component of any dish, always start with less and then work with more and taste and taste and taste. Um, if any, anybody was interested in vegetable stock, I just did peeled carrots, cut up, uh, Spanish onion, celery, a uh, knob of ginger, fresh ginger. I threw two Yukon gold potatoes in there because I like the starches, they break down after long periods of cooking and give it that thickness that the stew will need. I also put Algonquin squash in there. So that breaks down and thickens it up as well. Three cloves of garlic, two bay leaves, salt, thyme, uh, rosemary. So that gave me the base. And how much water did you add to that? I filled it up to cover everything. 
And then, I don't know, I let it go for about 10 hours off and on and kept adding water as needed because it will boil off. Mm-hmm. Like no, a, a big stew pot on the stove. Exactly. Cool. Someone is asking if you can, how you can make maple sugar at home. Have I? Have I made maple sugar? Yeah, or how you make it, whether this is your homemade maple sugar or no, how you make it. This is store-bought. I can kind of run you through the process. Um, I don't know it that well. But you boil down maple syrup past the point that you use it for maple syrup. I'm not sure what that point is. And then, actually, hold on one second. So then once the maple syrup is the consistency that you want, you wouldn't use a bowl like this. It would usually be a longer trowel, but this is a uh, granulating paddle that I made. And from what I think you do is you just move it back and forth. And while that syrup that's been cooked past the point of syrup cools down, that's what creates the granules with the moving of the paddle. So as you can see, I want to try it, but I haven't tried it yet. So that's, that's about the best uh, tutorial I can give you. Thank you. That's perfect. Folks, I also want to just give you a little tip. If, if you'd like to see more of Jesse, you, you can also mouse over the top uh, right corner of your of your screen where it says speaker view and you can make who, whomever is speaking larger mostly Jesse and you can kind of toggle between the two modes and so what I just did with the uh, the cornbread is not a necessary step but it's something I like to do is I throw a little duck fat in there and I do that after the hot water has been in there it just adds like a that kind of like butter and biscuits almost, but. So do you want the duck fat to be uh, really cold when it goes in there, Jesse? If I was if I was in, if I was doing boiled cornbread where I made the dough and then boiled it, I would want it in there cold. But since this is hot water cornbread, um where the hot water is added to the cornmeal, it would have just melted. So I added it after it's still melted, but it kind of just distributed through. That okay, thank you. And question from Lisa, whether you've tried bear fat. I haven't yet. I've been waiting to get a bear myself or someone who does hunt bear to graciously give me some, but I have not yet. But yeah, that would have been probably the more used fat than anything else for, for cooking. I have had moose nose and anybody who follows me on my Instagram knows how much I love moose nose. That is probably the best fat that I have ever had in my life. And it's not eaten so much around here anymore. Um, I know out west in the Ojibwe Cree territories, it's more prevalent. I'm not sure why it kind of came out of fashion here, but, you know, back when you were eating high protein diets, you need the fat. And so you're getting any fat you could off the animal, whether it was bear, bear fat. And then, you know, moose have a fair amount of fat. You just have to find it. Deer, not so much, but. Jesse, could you show your Instagram handle? At the Dawnland Kitchen, or you can search my name. A-E-S-S-E-E-L-A-W-Y-E-R. And so here's the main attraction. This is a piece of moose loin. This came from my buddy, Jeff Stewart, who is Penobscot. That's the gentleman I actually went on the moose hunt with. This was his harvest from last year. Um, 
So yeah, it's pretty clean. You can, if you want to replicate this recipe, if you don't have mousse, a lot of people don't, um, you could use venison loin, or if you don't have access to venison loin, you could use beef tenderloin or even pork loin if you want. And is that a couple of pounds? That's about a two pound piece, yeah. Maybe a little more, a little less. And for folks who missed it, could you just repeat the general gist of the cornmeal ingredients or the cornbread ingredients and I'll put them in the chat? Um, it was about a cup of cornmeal, uh, boil a bunch of water, add it liberally, salt, maple syrup or maple sugar, and um, that was it, and duck fat. I'm just going to heat up that cast iron skillet over medium heat and then just going to season with some salt. The beautiful thing about wild game is you do get nice wild hairs on your mm -hmm. people as well. Are you using um, coarse salt? Yeah, just kosher salt. You can use sea salt. I mean, you could use iodized salt if you want. Um, but every professional kitchen uses kosher salt. Can't tell you why, but it's delicious. Um, Helen was wondering about where you can source duck fat. Oh. I know Flatlander Farms, they, yeah. they raise ducks. I don't know if they sell duck fat. I have, through work, access to almost any ingredient I want. So maybe some of these obscure ingredients like duck fat where some people aren't familiar with, I'm not, I don't know how to get it. Because even for myself in my kitchen, I will get a lot of stuff through work. It sounds like Market 32 has it. You could also, yeah, seek out Flatlander Farm in Starksboro. We also have amazing duck eggs. They do. City Market used to carry duck eggs. I tried the other day to find them and they didn't have any, unfortunately. All right. So now we're going to sear our mousse once this pan is hot. I don't know if anybody can see that, but this is the stew. Yeah, it looks good. Nice and thick and hearty. So this will probably feed more than four people for sure, six. And that miso was a nice touch. For sure. So you can cook your protein however you'd like. I tend to shoot for medium rare. I will cook rare if it's really fresh. I think you get the best flavor of the meat. Um, after that, I don't know. I don't like medium, medium well. So we do want our pan really hot for this. Um, we want a nice sear, nice char on the outside. 
to for when we roast it it just makes the meat that much tastier I'm also gonna start heating another pan for our cornbread. And add a nice healthy portion of duck fat. Any cooking oil is really fine with this. I would use probably vegetable oil if you didn't have it or Crisco. Just any temp that holds heat and doesn't burn. Butter would tend to burn. That's a squash. Um, if I turn the heat up higher, it would get caramelized. It's not high enough, I guess. So we're just gonna let it go a little bit longer. How high is the oven at? Like 350 or a little higher? A little higher, 375. I also wasn't taking into account that my oven isn't a convection oven used to cooking at work. Yeah, that's that's real. Um, so I also suggested using bison meat in, instead of moose. Do you think that would work well for this? Yeah, that would be fine. Really any protein you'd like that's red meat. I'm just forming this. You can form it into smaller pieces. I want to do one big piece because the idea with this is it would be shared. So traditionally everything was shared, big pots, you know, big pieces of everything. For this shared version, how thick is that about? Like a half an inch. Okay. Uh, so folks are asking if they could be able to watch this video later or share it with folks and we are recording it and we will share it out probably later in December with folks who registered so you can share it out with other people. Well, that did not work out how I wanted it. It is a little loose. I'd probably do less butter or less uh, water, it's not as pretty. Jesse, can you talk about the uh, what the ideal resting time is for the, the dough? Um, I would say usually like a half hour. I would usually rest it for a little. Uh, and room temperature? Yeah, room temperature. Let that room okay. heat, keep that cornmeal. Let that residual heat with the cornmeal 
take all that liquid in. Thanks. And folks are starting to swoon out there on the uh, on the chat. Oh my gosh, I'm imagining the smell. Uh, yum, Jesse, this is amazing. I think folks are getting hungry. <laughs> And the question, how much water in the pan? At least I think, are you referring to, yeah, it is fat. It's not water. Yeah, there's fat. Um, yeah. Probably like a quarter of an inch. Whatever size dough you make, probably half that. And so the stew is completely vegetarian. I wanted to leave that vegetarian for anybody who doesn't eat meat. Jesse, I'm curious if you could share a little bit about like how you came to cook. Did you have teachers or was it something that you came up with to do on your own? Just a little bit about that background. So Fred Wiseman, he was the one that really nudged me in the right direction, or not in the right direction, but nudged me into the uh, direction of Abenaki cuisine. I've always been interested in it just because it is my profession. But I don't know, I guess for a while I didn't feel like I had enough skills or the correct mindset to do it and do it justice. And, you know, to an extent, I don't know that I still do, but... I'm ever learning and I have a great group of colleagues and teachers in the indigenous food world that help me out whenever I need it. But yeah, I don't know, something around three years ago clicked and I was like, I need to do this. And so I did it and continue to do it. And I haven't been doing that much in like the restaurant world with indigenous food. I've been mostly doing it at home and for my family and wanting to inspire other natives locally or throughout the country, I guess, to, you know, cook what is ours. And that's kind of been my push lately is more internal than external for cooking. Well, that's really awesome. I know you've done a couple of pop-ups like with Shelburne Farms. Yeah, did one with Shelburne Farms, one at the Great Northern, uh, one at the Echo Center. So now that this is seared on all sides, I'm going to drop the temperature to 350 and pop it in the oven. And there was a question out there. You, you did not put any fat in, in the meat pan, right? Uh, I did the avocado oil. You could use olive oil, sunflower oil. But yeah, there was there was uh there was fat in the pan. Okay, and then uh, we have a few more questions. Good plant-based duck fat substitute? Question mark. Uh, couldn't tell you. I am not very versed in uh, plant-based diets. Yeah, so if folks out there have any vegetarian options, Crisco was one. I don't know about Crisco. Uh, and then Indigo, who's eight, wants to know how hot does the cornbread need to be? Uh, internal temperature or the pan? Uh, let's see if Indigo can clarify. In the pan. In the pan. Um like 300 to 350. Just usually when the fat starts to simmer, or the oil starts to shimmer is a good indication. It's time for whatever you're putting in that fat. So now I'm gonna add the squash. And let those flavors mingle. 
So everything doesn't come out perfect. My cornbread did not come out per perfect. So I don't feel bad. So Mary is asking whether you've been cooking since childhood. Yeah, I, I have, but um, right about nine, I started cooking meals for myself and the family. Um, nothing extravagant, but I always have, I've always had a love for cooking, but it wasn't until later in life that I made it a career. Um, I'd studied graphic design in college and that's kind of where I wanted to be. And then, um, I never finished school and started working in a pizza place as a delivery driver and got sick of working for tips. So I was like, I want to cook, ended up learning how to cook. And then from there, I went to Sweetwater, started as a fry cook and worked my way out. So it wasn't probably until seven years ago, like I actually became passionate and wanted to make a career out of this and make delicious food for others to enjoy. The question about hickory nut oil, is that something that you've ever seen or used? I've used walnut oil, but um, it's not very good for cooking. It doesn't hold a high heat that other oils and fats do. It's better for like a salad dressing. You can also do pumpkin or squash seed oil for dressings as well. Those are good. So what time is it? Seven o'clock. Okay, so we're gonna try this cornbread again. Not happy with it. So it does taste good, it just doesn't hold up well. What's the flavor like for those of us who aren't eating it? Wild duck fat. The corn flour is delicious. Very crunchy, soft inside. Just a hint of the maple. Nice. And what would be another way to cook that? Like, would you bake it or would you prefer to cook it over a fire, like in a cast iron? What are some other ways that you could cook it? If you just want to mix the water and cornmeal together to make the dough without boiling the water first, you can bake it or you can boil it after. So create your cornbread shape and just boil it in hot water for about half hour, 40 minutes. And that'll give a softer bread. It still won't have like that bite as gluten breads, but it'll be a softer bite than this one for sure. Thanks.
That's a stew, that's all done. Jesse, in the beginning, you mentioned a little bit about wild harvested foods. Could you talk a couple, about a couple of those that you might use in your cooking? Yeah. So again, that's nothing that I really, or it's something I don't know a lot about. Um, I rely on others that are more knowledgeable, knowledgeable than myself. Um, Wild mushrooms is probably the biggest one I've gotten into and enjoy eating. Um, myself, I haven't gone out and picked them, but sumac, uh, wood sorrel is a good one I like to use. I just discovered elderberries this year for the first year. You know, any number of berries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, that's kind of in my wheelhouse. Nice. And what kind of mushrooms are you into? Um, so I've been eating a lot of chicken of the woods. Nice, yeah. I eat morels when I can get a hold of them. Pheasant bags are okay, not my favorite. Do you think that you could put that bowl a little bit closer to the camera so we can see what you're doing? Yeah, that's better. So this one I'm going very light on the water so I get consistency at long. So this is a cornbread take two. This is cornbread take two. I didn't gotcha. use my own words and I didn't add a little bit at the time. A little bit at a time. This one's much stiffer. This one will be much better to cook. With. There's a question about uh, ramps because there are obviously so many around here, and whether you've what you're doing with those. Forgot about ramps. One of my favorite foods. Yes. Yes, those are another one that are very easy to identify. I, there is one lookalike that I think there are more cases of people getting sick on them this year. I think with everybody locked down from COVID, a lot more people uh, wanted to get out and learn new things. Um, but I do love ramps. There's no flavor that can compare to them. And for folks that ramps are new to, it's essentially a wild leek or a wild onion and has a super pungent garlic onion flavor. They're really amazing as a, basically to start any dish, but also pickled. Charred on the grill as well. Nice, yeah. And you can do ramps too, you can do ramp pesto, you can make ramp oil, ramp compound butter, the possibilities are really endless. Anything you can use onions for, ramps can do it better. Yeah, Ashley uh, just posted that Lily of the Valley is the lookalike. Oh, okay. uh, Giveaway, it doesn't smell like garlic. So just um, make sure you have the information before you go out there. Yeah, that's another reason 
I haven't gone myself to look for mushrooms is I know nothing about them, so I'm not going to try and hurt myself. That's that's very fair. Um, Heather's wondering about your cooking tunes. What kind of music you like to jam to, either at work or at home when you're making food? I listen to a lot of reggae, um, both old school, new school. Listen to a lot of big drum music, like Young Spirit, Northern Free, a lot of old school hip hop, some rock. It varies. My taste is very eclectic, but. Sorry, letting the cat out. It sounds like there's a little handbook of wild Abenaki foods that that Fred Wiseman wrote for okay. wild crafting, if folks are interested. Um, and Fred is also really involved, if not the founder of the Seeds of Renewal project. Yeah, he's the, he is the founder for sure. Yeah, and he has some really great books as well. So folks were asking earlier in the chat about resources for learning more about Abenaki crops. I would say Fred Wiseman is someone to check out. And we'll humor Helen here. She really wants to know about your cat and what the cat's name is. So the cat's name is Loka. It's actually not my cat. It's my kids and their mother's cat. I'm just fostering it for the time being. Thanks. She might be somewhere around here. But she is a cool cat. She's a killer. She'll uh, bring me stuff and leave it on my porch. Nothing I can use, but. So is Fred still doing research into ancient foods is a question here? Do we know? I believe so. Um, I haven't talked to him for a couple months, but um, I did harvest some beans with him, I want to say at the beginning of September, so I would assume he is. I think he's kind of stepping away and letting the rest of the people take care of it, though. It sounds like someone's currently taking an ethnobotany class from him. Um, I'm also going to drop into the chat a little bit more about the Seeds of Renewal Project and Alma Bailey um, if folks are interested to learn more. Well, that's a good point, too, because what I'm doing with the cuisine is only one part of the process. You know, the, the seeds being our relatives and us being stewards of the seeds and them taking care of us as much as we take care of them. It's very important that the greater community at large is putting these back with the ceremony, back into the agricultural calendar and making it our own again, since we have the seeds, you know, making it part of our everyday life again. So, and there's probably more people that can speak better of that than I can, but I do feel it's important and I try to make that a part of what I do in using the crops, the corn, beans, and squash that I have been given, making sure I give them the utmost respect and honor that I can. Just like the ruined cornbread behind me, I'm still gonna eat that. Yeah, do you feel a difference when you cook Abenaki crops and foods than when you're cooking you know, colonial foods at work. Uh, definitely. It's, How it's does that feel to you? More enjoyable. I feel a larger sense of purpose. Um, and it's good that, I don't know, I just feel really good because I share, anytime I cook, I share. And I try to share with fellow Abenakis as much as possible. And when, you know, someone enjoys that food, versus me cooking at Sweetwaters and someone enjoying a burger. It just, it makes me feel that much happier with what I'm doing. You know, I still feel happy at work when people enjoy my food, but when we have something so nour nourishing as like, you know, the Three Sisters and this Moose Loin, and when I can share that with people, that 
that's what makes me feel the happiest. Nice. Yeah, do you want to share like a little bit more about the three sisters and, and that significance for you? So the three sisters is corn, beans, and squash. Uh, the beautiful thing about those three ingredients together is they make a complete protein. I can't speak more on the nutritional value of that. I'm just uh, regurgitating, regurgitating information. Um, out in the Iroquois territories, they're always grown together, but usually the corn is like the rock for the beans to grow up and the squash lake ground cover. Our three sisters don't work like that because our corn is so much shorter. It grows so much shorter than other varieties. All right, I'm just temping the moose right now. We're about 129. So between 130 and 135 for medium rare. We're gonna take that off and let it rest. And another conversation I was having with Chef Dave is, and part of what he's doing with speaking about the three sisters, that is that it's really a vessel. You're able to use that as your foundation and build off of it. He's like, one day it could be moose nose, one day it could be duck. So today it's moose and three sisters and some cornbread. So we're probably going to cut into this rather quickly because I think we're running out of time. But usually I would let this rest for 15 to 20 minutes. Let those juices redistribute into the meat so that way once you cut it, it doesn't just leak all over. And really any piece of meat, I would highly recommend letting it rest no matter how big or how small. Yeah, that's a finished moose loin. So for those of you who aren't watching the chat, uh, there will be a piece in Edible Vermont on featuring Jesse. Uh, and let me see, when is that? Oh, and Fred, of course. And that should hit the stands this weekend. And I think it's widely available. I've seen it at, at the co-op and in other places. And Marie posted a link to the current edition as well. So a heads up on that. Heather is wondering if you can eat moose rare. I do, 100%. Besides pork and chicken, there's probably not a piece of meat I won't eat rare. When, uh, when I was up in Maine at moose camp and we harvested Brother Moe's, the first night we ate the heart and that was rare. And that was probably one of the most delicious pieces I've ever had of moose. Yum, that looks so good. There you have it. Three sisters stew, roasted moose loin, and half baked cornbread. <laughs> awesome. 
So we have about 10 more minutes. That was amazingly on time, Jesse. Um, I amaze myself. So if folks have other questions <laughs> for Jesse to answer before we hop off, please put them in chat. Um, do you have any tips for keeping the meat warm but not cooking it further while it's resting? Um, it'll drop in temperature a little bit, but you I don't know. You also don't want meat like extremely hot when you eat it. So it's not going to drop a significant amount where it still won't be warm. But I, I definitely want to put it in the fridge. Just leave it out at room temperature. I, I do 15 to 20 minutes, but you can do shorter time, 10. Just it gives that, that time for those juices to redistribute. There's a little plug here that folks think you should open up an Abenaki restaurant. Uh, maybe one day when I have more knowledge and my skills are where they need to be and I'm not crumbling cornbread in front of, in front of 240 people. <laughs> A lot of folks are just showing some gratitude. Thanks so much for letting us in. Thanks for your passion is obvious. Thanks for sharing your talents with us. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah thanks, just, Jesse. I also just wanted to plug that the Department of Libraries has put together this really amazing list of books and films that align with a lot of what Jesse talked about and other themes that we're going to be covering this week. And so I'm going to drop the link to that book and film list um, into the chat. If folks are interested, it's also on NOFA's website. And there's everything from ages zero to adult for in different sections and different books for all age groups. So thanks for that resource. Yeah. <laughs> And any other questions before we wrap up? And feel free if you do follow me on Instagram to reach out. Um, I love hearing from people talking indigenous foods. I love learning more than I currently know. And you know, if, even if you're a home cook and you have some tips for me, I'm more than willing to hear them. I'm no expert. So. I love to engage as much as anyone else. So feel free. Awesome. And thanks for all the kids that have been on this today to watch yeah. and be inspired by you. We have Indigo and Cody and I see a few babies and uh, this is this is great. We uh, initially started the theme of intergenerational uh, cooking or intergenerational food and here we have it. So thanks for bringing all your kids too. Absolutely. That's it's really awesome to see folks tuning in together. And uh, Danielle's asking if there are more classes this week. And yes, there are. Um, there are four. This is the first of four. And I will go ahead and drop the link in the chat to the other three happening tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday nights. Um, and you can reach out to me via email to register. Um, and it will be a similar format, but a whole different topic. So I just put that in nofavt.org slash events. Anything else to share before we hop off? Lots more gratitude. Love to see that. Thanks for coming out. We've been brainchilding this series since January, and it's been through so many ebbs and flows with COVID. So it's really awesome to see it come together in its fruition and in a new form that is inviting so many new folks in. So we're really excited about that. And yeah, lots of thank yous. Cool. Okay, well, I think that'll do it for this evening. Thanks so much for spending your Monday with us. We really appreciate your time and energy. Yeah. I'll be following up with an email with more information about NOFA and membership and also the recording of this. Um, so feel free to look out for that and reach out if you have any questions and Jesse, I yeah, just put his Instagram handle again in the chat. So folks can, uh, look him up. Helen says, I can't wait to wing this meal. Love that. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say good night. Um, and thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Thank you.